I was asked to talk a little bit about keratoconus progression and particularly about the ABCD progression display and the second iteration. Many of you may be familiar with the first iter iter iteration. The second iter iteration is available at the booth and I understand within the next month will be released in a multi different language versions. If you think about cross linking, really the cross linking, the goal of cross linking should be the prevention of disease or the prevention of the loss of vision. Unfortunately, what most of us do now is we use cross-linking either inappropriately on patients who do not need it, or we wait too long till patients have already lost vision. Basically, our approach is like this. For those of you who are car nuts, this is a check engine light. It tells you when things have already gone bad. It's too late. But this is what our approach, when we use K-Max, if you think about it, K-Max tells us that the anterior surface, which is the major visual refracting surface, has already gone bad. What we really need is this approach, and that is something to tell us when things are going bad before they actually go, go bad. But if you look at all these different progression parameters that have been published on, if you look at every single one except pachymetry over here, these are all anterior surface parameters. In other words, it says disease progresses only when you've lost more vision. In other words, you've lost vision and now you've gotten worse. And that's really not the approach of medicine. This would, this would be kind of like going to the doctor and having high blood pressure, and the doctor saying, well, we'll start you on medication after your first stroke. That's not what we do. The goal is prevention of disease. So about two years ago, we came out with a new classification system called the ABCD classification. The reason we came out with that is because the classification that people have been using, which is a 70-year-old outdated classification, was only based on optical pachymetry and keratometry readings. It didn't look at any of the other anatomical layers, particularly the posterior surface. So the ABCD classification allowed anatomical grading of the anterior surface, the posterior surface, corneal thickness, and distance visual acuity. Additionally, AMSA CRUMAC was based on apical readings. And we do know, particularly in keratoconic corneas, the apex is not the thinnest point, and apical keratometry readings don't represent the actual steepness of the cornea. So the ABCD actually looked at the anterior surface, which is the A parameter, B parameter posterior surface, or back, looked at a three millimeter optical zone, centered on the thinnest point of the cornea. Again, not an ap apical reading. And this is currently part of the topometric keratoconus staging display. I'll blow up just the ABCD part here. And what you can see here is, again, anterior radius of curvature taken from a three millimeter zone at the thinnest point posterior or back, which is the B, radius of curvature, the thinnest pachymetry, and then the user has to enter distance visual acuity. And it gives you both a graphical analysis and a classification. So I can look at this and say, well, I have a normal anterior surface, but a prominent posterior ectasia, a moderately, a market, moderately thin cornea, but my distance visual acuity is normal. Why? Even though I have fairly advanced disease, because my anterior surface is still normal. But the real goal of that was not just the classification, it was really to utilize the classification to determine a way to determine when and if true progression occurs and to determine early enough that we prevent the loss of vision. So in order to do that, we're able to, able to determine not only ectatic disease earlier than using Amsler Crumac, but we need to then determine when and if true change occurred. So we looked at a, two different patient populations. We looked at a normal population and a keratoconic population, and we had to determine the noise levels of those measurements. Now, the anterior radius of curvature taken from a three millimeter zone and the posterior from a three millimeter zone centered on the thinnest were new parameters. So we had to do a study to determine the noise layer. And as I said, we looked at both normal populations and keratoconic. The reason we did that is if you have a very early disease in a very young patient, the noise level of those measurements probably closely more mimic a normal population. But someone who has more advanced keratoconic disease has inherently more noise in their measurements. And here you can see what we've come up with. And we have, again, the anterior radius of curvature. The red is a keratoconic population. The green is a normal. And exactly what you would expect. The keratoconic population is a noisier measurement, which what we expect, just like you heard in, in earlier, if you do uh, cal calculations on keratoconic patients for IOLs, it's a noisier measurement. And here again is what we used. And this was the original 
or version one of the ABCD display, and it showed a graphical analysis of the different anatomical layers, the anterior here, the posterior here, the minimal corneal thickness, and the distance visual acuity, and it showed you both graphically a change, and it showed you when and if you got past an 80 or 95% confidence interval. The confidence intervals are shown in red for the keratoconic population, in green for the normal, the solid line represents a 95% confidence interval, and the dashed lines represent an 80% confidence interval. Additionally, we showed you tabular, tabular a number of different parameters that people have historically used to determine pro progression. But this is the new version, as I said, is currently available to be seen at the booth and should be released within the next month or so, and represents a number of significant improvements in the display. Again, we show you graphically changes in the anterior surface, posterior surface, corneal thickness, and distance visual acuity. We show you again where the confidence in intervals are for both the normal and keratoconic population at an 80 and 95% confidence in interval. But let's look at some, some examples. First, again, a little close-up of diff different parts. This is again is just the graphical display of the ABCD parameters. Here again, is just the bottom part, which is the tabular format showing you. Here you can see the classification, the bad D. Uh, this is the progression index, ART max, and a number of anterior surface parameters. Again, showing you parameters that people have historically used to determine progression. You, you identify baseline here, and you can identify what your baseline is. You can also identify when you do a treatment and you can choose your comparison population, either normal or keratoconic. The default will show both. Here again, we can show you, we've only chose here to show against the normal population. Here we show it against the keratoconic pop population. Again, you as a user can choose what risk benefit you, you want to analyze. Do you want to compare against the normal population? Again, the suggestion is for your very early disease patients or subclinical, you should probably look at a normal population, but more advanced disease, compare those levels to, to the keratoconic population. Okay. You also have two ways of showing the data. This gets a little confusing in a short talk, but they're called aligned at baseline or full scale. It will default to aligned at baseline. Aligned at baseline maximizes the separation of the confidence intervals to give you kind of an easy way to determine if and when you have statistical significance. But what aligned at baseline does, it loses the graphical analysis of the different stages. In other words, if you look here, I can look at this and I can see here I have a bigger posterior ectasia than my anterior surface, but notice how close these confidence intervals are. Here, it basically spreads out the confidence intervals and it will default to show you this method because it's just easier for you to analyze. And that's basically what I said. So let's look at a couple examples here. I'm going to skip through just for reasons of time. And again, as we have in the current one, you can do a bilateral display and show both eyes. It does th make things a little more com compressed, so it's usually easier to show one eye at a time. So what are the features of, that are different from, from the version two? One is, once you put a treatment in, it eliminates the confidence inter inter intervals because the confidence intervals were determined based on a normal population and a keratoconic, not a post-cross-linking patient. So once again, you signify when a treatment occurs, notice there's no confidence intervals that fall below the treatment period. Clinical applications, here's a 15-year-old with advanced keratoconus and seven-year follow-up. You can see here, if we look over a seven-year period, marked change continuously, the anterior surface is progressing. Notice the posterior surface, again, continually progress, corneal thickness. The user here did an end to distance visual acuity, so again, it's a user operated. But here you can see that there's statistically significant change on each parameter. Here is a 15-year-old with very early keratoconus, so we chose only to show it against the normal population in a one-year follow-up. What's important about this is look closely, I don't know if you can read it here, but if you used K-Max here, there was absolutely no change. This is a young patient with no change in K-Max over a year. And if you look at the anterior surface, absolutely no change, stable exam. But notice what's happening on the back surface. 
marked, marked change in posterior ectasia. Progressive disease, subclinical disease, in other words, the patient remains with good vision, remains asymptomatic, but it's having progressive deterioration of their ectatic disease. This is when you should be intervening, not waiting until they have changes on the anterior surface and have lost vision. Here's a 15-year-old, again, early keratoconus, 21-month follow-up. Interesting, you'll see on this eye, the statistically significant change on the anterior surface, while the other, uh, sorry, while the other eye shows statistically significant change on the posterior surface. So again, both surfaces can change in independently. This is an interesting case. This was a normal, so-called normal eye in a patient with highly asymmetric keratoconus. The doctor and the surgeon opted to treat the advanced eye, but decided to observe this eye because there's some risk, obviously, to epi off cross-linking. And they followed this patient for a period of about four years. And after four years, the patient came in because they noticed a change in the distance visual acuity. So after a four years follow-up, they had about a two-line loss of vision. But notice what actually happened had they, and this was retrospectively analyzed, had they had the progression display. By the second exam, there was statistically significant change both on the anterior and the posterior surface and at an 80% level on corneal thickness. That is when they could have intervened and preserved vision at the 2020 level rather than intervening when they had a two-line loss of, of, of vision. So again, KMAX and utilizing the anterior surface only doesn't allow us to intervene and preserve vision. Here's a 16-year-old with progressive subclinical disease. Again, you can see changes on both the anterior, posterior, and corneal thickness in spite of the fact that it remains actually a subclinical disease. In other words, the patient is asymptomatic, but is having progressive ectatic change. Another example, and I'll end with this one, an 18-year-old with progressive disease, but again, stable K-max. You, you can't read these numbers, but they're absolutely stable on both eyes, but notice the change again on both posterior surface and corneal thickness, marked change here on the posterior surface. So the goal of this progression display, again, is to allow us to determine, based on a tomographic classification, one that recognizes all the anatomical layers, and to determine when and if progression occurs, and preserve vision, not intervene after we've already lost vision. Thank you. <laughs>